Cool. All right. So the recording has started. Okay. Hey everyone, so uh, two bits of admin quickly that we're just discussing, but I want on record for uh, uh, for the recording. So your test uh, after the vote has been taken. It was decided that your test should be on the 22nd, so it will be in the lecture venue uh, on the 22nd of March from 2 until 4. So it is a two-hour exam. It's going to cover the first two chapters, so linear algebra and analytical geometry. Um, so this week's lecture and next week's lecture are in that test, but I'll, I'll write out like more of a full scope and give you all the details of that in a Moodle announcement, but just so that it's there and whoever's watching the recording and obviously to you guys in the lecture, that's the test. Um, it's going to be heavily based on your tutorials and I strongly recommend you go through them, uh, which leads me to the second point is that if you do have a ticket open on Discord, I'm sorry I haven't got back to it yet. Uh, I have just been unwell this week, so I'm a little bit behind. But usually I try and have a much quicker turnaround time on those things than I've had. And you should get here back from me in the next like day or so. Um, so yeah, look out for that. Please do make use of that. And also chat to each other on like the general channels and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, also your tutors are, are there. But uh, the deal is that they they help me a lot with the marking. So I try to do more of the, the ticket system stuff. All right. Uh, anybody have any questions about the test or Discord or anything? Any admin related things to bring up? No, we're all good. Does anyone have any? Yeah, yeah. what's up? You mentioned that uh, the ranked melody proof will be somewhere in our test. Is there any other proofs that we should focus on? Okay, so ranked melody proof is not in your test. Okay. That was the that was the hint, and I do need to still write that up. That is on my list of things to do. Um, but that's there are other proofs that are like similar to it that come into it. But uh, I'm not going to ask any proof that isn't in the tutorials. So if you've done your tutorials, you've seen all the proofs you're going to get. I don't really care about you guys memorizing proofs. What I care about is, you know, there's usually a lesson in the proofs I like and I the proofs I give you. So do you see the you know, quote unquote trick to it? Um, and is that trick to it actually like something interesting and fundamental? Um, cool. Any other questions? Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah, I can't give you the, the solutions to that because it comes from a textbook and the textbook has copyrights. I cannot give out solutions, but what's happened in every year in the past is that together we've come to a set of solutions that everyone shares. So what I can do is check answers for you and mark them. So usually we collectively have a marked set of questions that come from you guys, and then that's fine. But I can't release the, the manual from the textbook. That's yeah, that just breaks copyrights, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, happy to check whatever workings you guys want to send me. And again, this is where you guys, you know, clubbing together reduces everyone's work workload. You know what I mean? Cool. Uh, any other admin stuff? Cool. All right. So today we're going to get started with uh, analytical geometry. Uh, it follows on obviously a lot from linear algebra, and the ideas are all all there. Um, again, the first six weeks of this course are relatively speaking, all just like usually considered linear algebra, but this breaks it down a little bit more. Um, and we're now going to start looking at things like how do you measure distances and, and do a little bit more of what is considered as the name says geometry uh, within vector spaces. But uh, the one extension of this is called an affine space. Uh, and just to point out again, today's lecture is going to be pretty definition heavy again, and then next week I'll go into intuition again. That's usually the flow of these things, of these uh, this course is like one week definitions, one week intuition. Um, last week we got more of the intuition in terms of bases and what a vector space actually means. But uh, yeah, so today it's going to be very definition heavy, but again, it's we need to get these down so that we can then get to the concept. Um, the first one of these is just an affine space, and I wouldn't complicate an affine space more than it needs to be. What it is, is just a vector space that is shifted away from zero. Okay, so let V be a vector space, as we discussed last week, but now we have some x0 that is an element of this V space over here, and then you have U, which is a subset, uh, subspace of V. All right, then the subset, which is the subspace U, plus this x0, uh, this x defines an affine space, all right? It's also called a linear manifold of V. And so what this really is, is just elements of this bigger vector space 
that corresponds to this subspace being shifted by X zero. Okay, and I'll show you, uh, there is a diagram of it now just to get a little bit of the intuition for it. But uh, one thing to know, this is used a lot in support vector machines, but in general, if you have some kind of, any kind of linear regression model or anything like that, where you have a bias variable, that's exactly what's happening here, is you have some kind of shift in your modeling that describes, um, yeah, that describes like kind of your general shift away from zero, and then everything else after that is then the actual, you know, modeling with the vector space. So you can think of this in terms of like a bias variable. Um, U is called the dir direction or direction space, and then X zero is called the support point. All right, so I think it also has another name, which I've made a note here. Yeah, it's also called the reference point, okay? So it is not necessarily, oh, sorry, let me let this person in. So what an affine space is not necessarily is a vector space. And the reason for that is because it doesn't necessarily have X zero, uh, which X zero is an element of V, which is this kind of broad ambient space that we're defining the affine space in, but it might not be an element of U, right? And in general, when an affine space is gonna be interesting, it's gonna be cases where it is not an element of U. That's where it's useful. Okay, if it is an element of U, then it just sits along the basis of U already, and so you're not gaining any flexibility of this. So what we want is to be able to take a vector space and shift it away from the origin in a way that kind of gives us more flexibility. Okay, and so an F1 space is often uh, discussed in terms of frames in computer graphics. Again, this is um, this kind of ways of representing graphics on a computer such that you have like this fourth dimension that allows your character to like move in and out that's usually what's going on with this affine space and so on. Um, and they're often represented as a parametric equation. So if we let L be X zero plus the subspace U be a k-dimensional affine space, then we can have the basis of U will also give us the basis of the affine space. All right, and then every element of L can be uniquely described as this shift point plus just whatever vector is sitting on U, okay? And that's literally all we need. And then obviously these are all, you know, coefficients, right? Like we're doing a linear combination of our basis vectors as we discussed last week. Okay, and so, yeah, this just says, remember the difference between a subset and a subspace. Subspace has uh, added definitions on top of the subset. Um, and so here is an intuition of what's going on. So in one dimension, we have an affine subspace, which is called a line. And this could be written in this form above here. So y is equal to x0 plus lambda b1. Your basis vector here is b1. Okay. And so this just defines a, I'm going to try to draw it a different color. So that just then defines that direction over there. So that would be your u. So any linear combination of this b1, so any point sitting along this line, so it's on that vector space U. But now what we're going to also do is we're going to add the support or reference point back to our vector space. And that will give us, and that will now give us this, well, what is a red line on a working projector up top there. So that's L. It is literally just take this vector space and shift it by how much the support point says. All right. And you can see that that's useful. Because if we're going to rep be representing this line without the support point, we would need two basis vectors, right? Because it's sitting in a 2D space and our one basis vector is that way, but I can't get to this red line just by using this B1, right? They're actually parallel. So I would then need some other basis vector to try and get onto it. But at the same time, that's now one extra basis vector that I don't need. It is still a line. It still is only a one dimensional thing. So this basis vector, the second basis vector that I would need here would always have the same value. And so that's a bit of a waste. And essentially you can think of the support point as just being that. It is the second basis vector with a consistent coefficient. And we just call it one or whatever you want it to be, all right? We can then define it to be easy, which is then just X zero, okay? But again, it's if you're dealing with the, the concept and the geometric interpretation of this, what you've done is you've taken something that would require two basis vectors, you've taken a 2D space, and you've turned it into a 1D space with a shift. 
So if what you're doing is putting a line to a bunch of data points, it's a bunch of green data points. Now what you've got is the, a bunch of the yellow data points. Now what you've got is the shift away from zero, which is your bias term in linear regression, plus your gradient, which would be the lambda term. All right, and this is exactly what a linear regression is doing. Okay, so that is called an F1 space, and it can be directly extended to Rn, in which case you would have, again, a one-dimensional less affine space. All right, and these are called hyperplanes, so it would be an N minus one hyperplane sitting in Rn. The reason you might, you know, you don't really care if your X zero is an element of U, okay? So we define U as any linear combination of P1 here, all right, so that's again this line there. If x0 is an element of u, then what this corresponds to is a shift off of this b1 in its in that direction of b1. So then in which case x0 would be something like this. Um, like there, that would then be x0. But as you can see, we're now still sitting on x0. We can still only represent this line. So we haven't really gotten anything from that shift. So as much as then, you know, this is still now a vector space because this zero element is on this line. As far as the modeling is concerned, as far as the geometric representation of data is concerned, you haven't gained much. So you're going to only try and use something like an affine space where there is this consistent shift in one direction away from zero. And that is in a direction that isn't given to you by your basis vectors. And then in which case, you can make one, a problem one dimension less, which in machine learning and data science is always a bit of a blessing. So again, vector space shifted from zero, that's an affine space. Don't complicate it too much. Uh, one cool thing about this is that if you consider the system AX is equal to B and solving that system of linear equations like we did in the first week, that forms an affine space where what you're doing is, so the solution of the system is either empty set or an affine space of Rn, of dimension n minus rank a, so we went over the rank nulli theorem. But what we've got here is b is then just the support point, right? It is your shift away from zero. And then after that, once you've got ax minus b is equal to zero, you've now then just got, what is my shift? Once I've taken away that shift in the data, so once I've taken this line back down there, now how do I fit? What is the, the kind of solution space of this problem? I've removed the general shift of the data. I've got a, uh, I've got a zero element now in my problem. All right, I've now got the zero element there, and now I'm solving for where that is true. Where do I still on this one? Okay, so affine spaces is something we've already dealt with in the non-trivial solution uh, or the particular solution of a system of linear equations. Okay. Uh, and just note where it says an empty set and the dimension A is not the same thing. So if something has dimension of zero, it means the set has one element, all right? So when it says the, uh, just don't get confused and think that like, there's now zero dimensions means that now there's the empty set or something like that. Zero dimensions means we have a particular solution, okay? If you have one dimensions, it means there's a line of infinitely many solutions on that line. Whereas if it's empty set, that means there's no solutions. So just a, a weird way of speaking about maths that can be confusing is that. But uh, yeah, just keep your, keep your words about you, I guess. All right, and then we can generalize all the concepts we've then had about vector spaces can now be generalized to an affine uh, space, such as mappings. So we know from last week that we have mappings between vector spaces, so V and W are vector spaces, then we have a mapping between the two. Um, and then A, A can be then the, the support point. So if we know how to map from B to W, then all we have to do is do a consistent mapping on the vector spaces and then provide the appropriate shift afterwards. Okay, and then the vector A is called the translation affine mapping vector of this, of this phi. Okay, so phi is an affine mapping and what it corresponds to is some kind of operator on the vector subspace that we're dealing with, plus some kind of shift that counteracts the normal shift of your affine space. Okay, so you need both. But just like 
you know, vector spaces, you get, want to have full uh, flexibility of that. All right. So what notes I'm going to while I was going through this. Uh, just be careful of the notation here. Capital phi represents a vector linear mapping and smaller case phi is the affine mapping to go from the vector space to affine mapping where add the translation. So yeah, just be careful of this. So capital phi here is what works on the vector space. This little lowercase phi is what work, is the actual affine mapping, which incorporates this A shift and the, the general linear mapping. Okay, and then, so the properties of affine mappings, they come pretty much from your vector spaces uh, and vector mappings. So many of the useful properties of linear mappings are still present with the affine mapping. The composition of two affine mappings is an affine mapping, all right? So if I add two vector transformations and I have two of these shifts and I combine them, then they're the exact same thing, okay? Uh, then the affine mapping keeps the geometric structure invariant, and what that means is that the number of dimensions is preserved and the parallelism is preserved. And then lastly, an affine mapping can also be constructed from composing a linear mapping and the translation separately. So you can consider them as two separate pieces of transformation. All right. So I trans I linear map and then I translate. But in that case, you do have to be consistent with your thinking about that order. It is I take X, I linear map first, and then I translate. If you do it the other way around and you're translating and then affine mapping, then it's not going to always be consistent and then it's not going to actually be the same thing. So you have to do it in that order. You, you linear map first so that you're staying on that subspace and then you sort the translations out afterwards. All right. Is everyone comfortable with that? What I want you to know from affine mappings is the general number one, why they're useful for data. So the fact that it helps you consider things like biases in your data, so a general shift away from zero, and then afterwards you drop a dimension of your problem, so it's easier to you know model, and then just the fact that it's a shift, it's you know an extension of a vector space. I don't need you guys to know uh, affine mapping transformations and stuff like that, but know know the definition. Is everyone happy with that so far? Can we get started on the next thing? Yes. Geometric structure is invariant. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that means so it's probably more like equivariant. So you know, last week when I was drawing that a picture of that green vector, and then when you kind of changed bases and things like that, the vector itself didn't change. That's an example of invariance. How we're measure, measuring the line is uh, is changing, but in general, the object itself isn't changing. In general, when we think of affine mappings, they're usually in places where we don't want to be compressing the dimension or anything like that. We don't want to be losing information about it. It's more like an easy way to preserve information. And so that's what it's kind of saying. So affine mappings keep the ge geometric st structure, um, lines that are you know, parallel. So if I have two lines like that and I map them onto a new space, so let's just say I rotate them and I shift them like this, they're still going to be parallel afterwards. That's not going to change and things like that. Um, there are examples in like computer graphics mainly where this is not not the case where like two parallel lines might then like end up crossing when you change perspective and things like that that's an example of uh well not invariance i would call it more like equivariance equivariance means how the objects change is in accordance to the operator acting on them so again if i if i rotate by 30 degrees then the objects themselves change 30 degrees but uh you know, it's kind of just a, a terminology English thing, how you use this. Um, yeah, a good example of um, invariance and stuff in, in data science is if you're using like convolutions on images, uh, you can shift the image like down and to the right. 
And then when you run a convolution over that, if you know about convolutions, if you don't, then you can somewhat ignore this analogy. But if you've done any image processing or that, then when you run a convolution over the image, the output of that convolution will also shift down into the right in the exact same way that you shifted the image down into the right. And so that is known as equivariance. The output shifted equally the way that I shifted the input, let's say. So input down to the right, the output shifts down to the right and those sorts of things. It's uh, when we get onto like high levels of mass, it's how you define groups and well, more general ideas of groups. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's that. But anyway, I don't need you guys to be tuned to that. I just, you know, you ask the question. So there's the, the general information on it. Everyone else kind of happy? Cool. All right. So we're going to get into analytical geometry then. And the first definition of this is a norm. And this is somewhat backwards. So I'm going to define a norm. Then we're going to go take like a long detour. And then we're going to get back to defining a norm later on. Um, but just for the pure definition of it, a norm on a vector space V, and again, we're talking about vector spaces here. In an affine space, you would not be considering the, uh, the shift in this case. All we care about is maybe the, well, you would consider the shift. It would be in a consistent way. Anyway, for the moment, let's just consider the, the vector space, uh, just a normal vector space for now. So it does include the zero. All right, so this is a function denoted somewhat strangely with these two bars. And then when you see like a dot like that or something, it, you'll even get uh, that big value, so f of dot. What it means is that this dot is just an argument to a function. It's similar to saying, you know, x, but it's more a case of if I have like a set that I'm going to be putting into this rather than a single value. But anyway, you can, when you see a dot, you can think of that very similar as just like a variable. Something is going in there. So we have these two bars on either side and something's going in there. And what we're taking is a vector from V and we're mapping it to a real number. And so specifically, we're taking X, which would be an element from V and mapping it to the output of this norm over here. All right, we can actually take that away. Okay, which assigns each vector its length, and the length is denoted by that. So this norm is its length. It's an element of the real numbers, such that for all lambda elements of the reals and x and y elements of the vector space, the following holds. So absolute homogeneity. So if I have a scalar multiplied by an x value and I take its norm, that is the exact same thing as first taking the norm of the vector and then multiplying by the absolute value of the scalar. So direction doesn't matter here. So if it's a negative scalar and I'm, you know, so if I start with X like that and I multiply by a negative scalar, it's going to end up facing the opposite way. But the length itself is still just double. So we don't actually care about the direction of the scalar or anything like that. And so it's the absolute value of it. You, in general, can't get a negative norm. Um, then you have the triangle inequality. So the sum of two vectors, if you take its norm, it's less than the norm of each of the vectors uh, individually summed. And you can see why it's called the triangle equality over here. So if I have a vector X over there, okay, and the vector Y over there, and I add them together, we're gonna get the vector Z, all right? That forms a triangle, but then we know that the length of y plus the length of x is going to be shorter than just going directly by the length of z. And that's literally just uh, the intuitive thing is that either you can start at this point and go directly along z, and that will give you the length of z, or I can take the laborious long way of, come on, of first going along y and then going along x to get to the same endpoint. And so obviously that's going to be at least longer. All right, depends how you measure your space, but that is at least as long as going directly there. Okay, so that's why you have the less than or equal to there. And then lastly, and importantly, it's positive definite. So in fact, this greater than or equal means it's positive semi-definite. If we wanted positive definite, it would just be greater than, but we'll come to that in a couple of slides. But for now, positive definite, it means this norm is always greater than zero, and if it is equal to zero, then it means X itself had to be the zero vector. All right. So only if I pass in the zero vector, do I get out a zero length. Somewhat intuitive, but uh, it's kind of useful, especially when these definitions start getting more general and abstract. 
All right, so those are the three main properties of a norm. And if they hold, then we have a norm. And so one example that is uh, kind of, again, intuitive is known as the L1 norm or the Manhattan norm. So in this case, what you do is you actually just take the absolute value of all your individual elements of X and add them together. So you're literally taking like, you know, straight line distance of things rather than going directly there. So that is one way of defining distance. And you can kind of see how it's defined. Sorry, you can kind of see how it's defined here. So what this red line is, is it's going to show you all the places. Sorry, it's not red, this black line or this yellow. There's a yellow line there. So what that's going to tell you is all points in this 2D vector space where your L1 norm is equal to one. Okay, so obviously it's somewhat intuitive then that it's literally pointing directly up and directly to the right. Okay, so when you have zero vectors or zero values in one dimension and one in the others, and all you're doing is adding those values together, then that's you know fine that on the corners it's going to be it's going to be one and one. But what's interesting is how it kind of interpolates between these two points, and in this case it's going to be a straight line. All right, so this vector here where it's sitting at 0 0.5, wait, at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, that is then also an element of the set, and so is negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, and so on. Okay? And so that's all sets, all points in the 2D spa space, we have an L1 norm of 1, but there's other kinds of norms, and the most familiar one is called the Euclidean norm, and in this case, Again, we have the two extreme points of one in either dimension together, but now it interpolates more smoothly and it forms a circle. All right. And that is due to the fact that it's just defined differently. And so what this is, is the square of each of the individual elements. Then you add it together. And then lastly, you do the square root. Okay. And by squaring, what you do is you end up putting uh, more kind of pressure on the extremities so when they're closer to one so obviously one squared is one and then but like 0 0.9 or something squared is still fairly close to one but then when you get to out at kind of a 45 degree angle because you're squaring something that is now a fraction it's going to get smaller a lot quicker so you have to go slightly further out to get to a unit norm right to get to a length one norm and that is why the length one norm this is kind of has sharp edges Whereas here, this has the round edges that are further out. It's because this space here is pushed out by that squaring that you're doing to the individual elements. All right. These are used again a lot in neural networks and things like that as regularizers, and they have different properties. So, what this usually does, this Euclidean norm, is it usually wants to bias you towards kind of uh, these kind of points along here, like roughly 45 degrees. So, it promotes uh, balance in your parameters. Whereas the L1 norm pushes you towards edges, usually, if you're using uh, kind of linear regressions and things like that. Anyway, that's a side point. For our case, we just care about vector spaces in general, and these are two different ways of defining distance on the space. And this one is known as the Euclidean distance. Uh, it's also called the L2 norm. And then I've written over here the general equation for this. And so this is known as the P norm. And so what this is, is the, you take each of your individual elements of X, you do the absolute value on it first, then you take the power of P, so you can kind of see that up there, the power of P, then you sum all of those things together, and then after you've done the sum, you take the P root of this, okay? So one thing to note is the only reason that you don't have an absolute value there is because squares are always gonna be positive, you don't need to absolute value anything, but uh, in general, you could if you wanted to, and then this would still be your L2 norm. So P norm is just a way of generalizing this notion of L1, L2, all of these kinds of norms. And then an interesting, important point of this is that the Euclidean norm is just the high dimensional equivalent of Pythagoras theorem from school. Okay, so it's just the, the general way of kind of calculating distance you would have at least seen in two dimensions in school. Okay, so that's norms, just ways of calculating distance. Seems pretty arbitrary at the moment, but it's now going to become slightly more concrete as we go through today's lecture.
And the way to make this more concrete, but with this in mind that where we're heading is to define a norm, is uh, an inner product. Okay, and this is the most general kind of you know, concept we're gonna have today. So an example of an inner product you have likely encountered is known as the dot product. You almost definitely encountered it because it's the way we do matrix multiplication, right? So you just there take the, if you're doing A times B, A times B, you're just taking the a row of A timing it by a column of B and you're doing the dot product, okay? So the dot product is just a, a general idea that can be extended to matrices and it kind of generalizes to matrix multiplication. But the way this is just defined is that you take X transpose times by Y, okay? And ultimately that corresponds to each of the individual elements of X times by each of the individual elements of Y, sum them together, okay? So for example, if X is X1, X2, and then y is y1, y2, then this will give you x1, x2, times y, y1, y2, and then x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2. You just do the dot product of that normally. Okay, so that's the dot product. One thing I do wanna point out, and this is maybe a more pedantic point of this course that I think is important. And again, it's because uh, I'll show this to you next week. It has a, an important geometric way of thinking about it. Vectors are columns, okay? When they're rows, they're called co-vectors. It's a different thing, in my opinion. You don't think about it like you think about a vector, especially if you want to understand the geometry of these things. Um, so I do ask you just to keep that in mind as we go ahead, that once it's a row vector, it is doing something slightly different, okay? And we will we'll kind of come to the geometric understanding of that soon. But for now, column vector is a vector, row is a co-vector. Okay, weird kind of terminology thing that I just want to throw out now. But in this case, we've defined X and Y here as two different vectors, and then we just transposed X. So we took, by transposing X, we took it from a vector to a co-vector. And that is a perfectly fine thing to do with the transpose of a vector. All right, so that is the, the dot product, but there are a bunch of general inner products. Um, and so in order to provide a compact definition of a general inner product, a couple of preliminary concepts are needed. Uh, uh, listen guys, my, my nose is frustrating me. Do you mind if we take a 15 minute break now and we'll come back and do a longer session next? Thanks.
All right, guys, do you want to start uh, getting ready again? Of course, this is the moment that the Wi-Fi drops. Okay, uh, does anyone have anything to ask quickly before we get back into it? So, yeah. I was supposed to use some sort of, uh, I don't know, software or something to use the notes, and I tap on the, those notes that you make that you want. Yeah. You find that it pops up, but what you put in goes under the page of the other one, so you just see it. Is anyone else having this problem? When I open on my laptop, it kind of just pops open the black text on top of it. Uh, okay, can you maybe show me afterwards what the problem is and then I'll, I'll try to fix it with um, Yeah. Cool. All right, thanks, Jimena. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about general inner products. We just spoke about the one version of this, which is the dark product, but now we, there's a general notion of in a product. Okay. Um, guys, can someone online just confirm you can hear me all right? <laughs> okay. Probably no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, cool. So we're now going to define the general notion of an inner product. And in order to provide a kind of compact definition of this, there's a couple preliminary, more preliminary definitions we need. There, uh, a couple of preliminary definitions we need. And the first is the notion of a bilinear mapping. And this is just an extension of what we covered last week, which is a linear mapping. So I've written that at the top there. So a linear mapping is some mapping phi, uh, omega here that when you take in lambda, so lambda is a scalar, times by x, x being a vector, plus phi times y, phi a scalar, y a vector. When you take in this entire operation and then perform the, the uh, mapping on it, it is the same as first performing the mapping on x, and then scaling by lambda, and then first performing the mapping on y, and then scaling by phi. So what it is, it was those two properties of distribution in, and then being able to swap around scalar multiplication and the mapping itself. All right? And so now we're going to generalize this concept into something with two arguments. All right? Two being in the first position and the second position over there. 
Okay, so this mapping now, so, so let V be a vector space and omega is a bilinear mapping. Uh, if for all x, y, and z elements of V and lambda phi elements of real, that if I have lambda times x plus phi times y, so the same as up here in the first argument, z in the second argument, then I can distribute in and change the order of scalar multiplication so that it's doing omega on x and z, then multiplying by lambda, doing omega on y and z, then multiplying by phi. Okay, that's on the first argument. So because x and y were in the first arguments there, together being added, then they become the first arguments of the two different mappings over there. All right, I can do the exact same thing on the second argument. So in this case, I have x as the first argument, and then the scalar times by the vectors added together in the second argument, I can once again distribute and take out the scalar multiplication and do them separately. So now we have y and z as your two second arguments and a consistent x as the first argument. All right. So it is the exact same linearity rule from up top here in one dimension, but just applied to two different arguments separately. Okay. And then the one part of the argument, so the z or the x, which didn't have the distributivity or anything else going on there, that just stays consistent. If it was the second argument here, it's the second argument there and the second argument there. Okay. So no need to distribute or act on Z or do anything on Z. This is known as bilinear. Bi meaning two arguments, linear because it has this distribution scalar property. Okay, so 12 asserts that if phi is linear in the first argument and equation 13 asserts that omega is linear in the second argument. All right, and so I wrote, I wrote it out in steps at the bottom here that you can see as well. So first I distribute the omega and get the first rule. And then after that, I've now got the omega x here and the phi y there, which you can pull out the phi and the omega up there. And that's the important bit as well in this is that it takes a scalar in one of the arguments to pull it out. Okay, you don't need phi x and phi z, it's just phi x gets pulled out to become phi of omega. Okay, so only one of them needs the scalar. That's the, the only thing to this that might get a little bit tricky. So I think the distribution is a little bit more intuitive. Okay, so any a scaling any of your arguments is the same as scaling the entire term afterwards. Okay, then we have the okay, so that is the notion of a bilinear mapping, it will come up in a second. Then we have symmetric and positive definite. So if V is a vector space, omega is a bilinear mapping, and it is taking in two arguments, both from the same vector space V and mapping onto the reals. Okay, then uh, omega is called symmetric if for two different x and y elements of the V, if I swap the ordering that I pass them in to the, um, to the mapping, they are equal, then it is a symmetric mapping. All right. Secondly, if omega is, uh, omega is called positive definite, if for the same elements of the vector space. So it's X being passed in twice, all right, as first and second argument now. If that is greater than zero in all cases, except for where X is ze the zero vector itself, then it is positive definite, okay? So I'll go through that one more time because it is a little bit nuanced. So in the first case of symmetry, I have two potentially different vectors from the same vector space, X and Y. I can pass them in in any order, then omega is symmetric. If I can pass in the same vector and I know that I will get a positive value out of the mapping, then it is positive definite. Okay. Another way to say it is the only way to get a zero out of the mapping is to pass in the zero vector. Then obviously it gives you zero. Okay. So that is. Symmetric and positive definite. So we've got three terms we're now trying to keep in memory for two minutes. So bilinear mapping, symmetric, positive definite. Then let the V be a vector space with this omega bilinear mapping. Then a positive definite symmetric bilinear mapping is called an inner product. So it meets all three constraints. All right. 
So if I, and you typically denote it with those kind of uh, brackets over there. Okay, so it is linear in terms of both of its arguments. Okay, in the sense that it can be distributed and you can take out the scalar. Okay, so that's the bilinearity of it. It is symmetric in the sense that I can swap the order of X and Y. Okay, and it will still give me the same answer. And it is positive definite in the sense that if I do omega X, X, which is the same as doing square bracket or curly, you know, waiver bracket X, X, it's going to be greater than zero unless X is equal to zero. All right. So for non, for X not equal to zero, it's this thing will then be greater than zero. Okay. Those are three constraints that have kind of wordy ways of going about it. But in general, the, the kind of general notions here are fairly intuitive. I don't want this function to produce zero unless I've passed in a zero vector, okay, twice. I don't, I don't want, I want to be able to pass in X and Y in different orders and have it still produce a consistent, uh, the same output. That can't be taken for granted, but it will be true of a bilinear, of a, a um, inner product. Okay, and then lastly, I want to be able to distribute as if it's linear on both arguments. Okay, and that's maybe again, I think the bilinearity is the one that gets a little bit difficult to keep in mind, but it's just linearity in terms of both arguments. All right, if we have that, and again, what we're defining here is the uh, product, like the function omega. Okay, if we have a vector space, okay, and some inner product that operates under those three constraints, we have what is known as an inner product space, okay? And then if we use the dot product to find equation 11, it's called a Euclidean vector space. The dot product in terms of equation 11 was, yeah, sorry, the inner product in terms of equation 11 was the dot product. So if I take a vector space in Rn and I use the dot product as the inner product, then you have Euclidean space. All right, again, a lot of terminology, terminology, but it's kind of the, those three properties are really important in defining, uh, defining how we get to distance at least. So there are a number of inner products in Rn uh, that are not the dot product. For example, you can consider this case for R2. So I'm taking in uh, X and Y here, okay, and so in this case, what's going to happen is you're going to take the first element of X and multiply it with the first element of Y. Then you're going to take minus of X1 with Y2 and X2 with Y1. And you're going to add back two of X2 times Y2. This is an arbitrary example. There's nothing fundamental about this, but this fits the three constraints, all right? If you sub substitute it in uh, something like this, where it was X and then you had Wow, what was the matter? Oh, lambda. Lambda, lambda y plus phi z. And you put it into this, uh, this constraint. What you would end up getting is x1, I'm not going to write the whole thing out, times by lambda y1 plus phi z1 minus, and so on, right? So all you would do is take wherever this y1 was here. You would then substitute in y1 and z1 there. Okay, and then you'd foil it out and you could actually show that it's uh it can distribute properly. Sorry. I was hiding something there. I'm gonna have to do this the slow way. Okay, so firstly you would then can show by linearity, and the way you do that is again just substitute in, I would say in this case. You just substitute in this rule here and check that it works for both of them and just do the long task of taking this function and wherever you see y1, you put lambda y1 plus phi z1 and then you go instead and you substitute it in in this way and show that they're equal. That's, it's long and laborious, but conceptually not tough. Then afterwards, what you can do is then just do the definition following it this way, show that it's equal to the above. Okay, so that would then give you the symmetry constraints uh, from up here. 
And then lastly, you could then just say, uh, do this for X and X. And that was pretty easy to see because in that case, you would get X1 squared, X2 squared, and then X1 times X2, X1 times X2. And you can say that the, you can see that the only way that that is going to give you zero is if at the very least X1 is zero and Y, uh, X1 is zero and X2 is zero because you have these two terms here. All right, you would have to, you know, substitute in X1 instead of Y1 here and X2 instead of uh, Y2 here and set the whole thing equal to zero and then you would come to a conclusion based on just simplifying it, but that is the general strategy. Again, I'm not actually gonna ask you to do this, but just for your general understanding of how to go about proving things, that's what, you know, that's how you would do it for this inner product. Okay. Um, then symmetric positive definite matrices and the related theory. So this provides pivotal formalism for convex optimization and by extension, many aspects of linear, oh, sorry, of machine learning. Um, I mean, convex optimization is something we come to at the end of the course. It's the last chapter we'll cover. So we will get there, but uh, as you'll see in general, at least machine learning is an example of non-convex spaces, but in general, most of the ideas come from convex optimization anyway. So uh, it's kind of very related and obviously it depends a lot on symmetric and positive, positive definite matrices, but we will, we'll get to that. Um, there is a bit of this course that, because we used to do probability theory and we've decided to kind of move that into a different course, but uh, there is a very key, Key, uh, key relationship here with covariance matrices in the statistics. So I will still get to that. I will bring it up even though it's not directly in the course anymore. Okay, but for now, the relationship between inner products and matrices is what we really care about. So there exists a direct relationship between an inner product on a finite dimensional vector space and a matrix operator specifically, and this is kind of very important to what we discussed last week, so let V be an n-dimensional vector space with a defined inner product, so some function that fits the definition of those three points we just gave, and an ordered basis B1 to Bn, all right? So we have a basis of Rn. Then for any two vectors, X and Y, in the space V, we know that we can write them as a linear combination of our basis vectors, right? We've already done that from last week. But now because of the bilinearity of this function, we know that we can pull out the two scalars, okay? So that's the first thing, is we're gonna pull out the scalars. And the scalars are these phi's and lambdas. And also we know that we can pull out the summation, all right? So the summation bit is, let's get back to where I did this in pieces. So here what we're doing is we're distributing in, okay? What we're actually gonna do now is do it the other way around we're pulling out the summation first. Okay, so this is happening over here. So the summation over the lambda Bs and the, sorry, over the, yeah, lambda Bs and the phi Bs, we can pull out the summation from that distributivity law. And then the, the second step is we can pull out the multiplication by the constants, all right? So both of the, these two steps is just applying bilinearity in one shot, okay? What we're left with is now the inner product of our basis vectors. Okay, and this is then going to tell us how much does basis vector bi align with basis vector bj. Okay, because they don't have to be orthogonal. They can also be pointing in similar directions. And then in that case, this inner product is not going to give you necessarily zero unless they match. And so we do have to take into account how they, these bases kind of share directions. But then what this will give us is essentially just a matrix A. And all of the elements of this matrix A, so element IJ of this matrix, will be the result of that inner product between basis vector I and basis vector J. All right? And then X hat and Y hat are the coordinates of X and Y with respect to basis B. So again, remember what I said last week where we have basis and your coordinates. It's exactly what that, that that's exactly what we've now just done, except going from this step here, We've just packed it into a matrix notation rather than a summation notation. But the summation comes from uh, the summation on the second line. The summation on the second line just comes from doing this matrix multiplication here. Okay, so the matrix multiplication of A and Y hat will be that first summation there. 
and then X transposed off that would be that second summation. Okay, well, we've gone through the definition of matrix multiplication. I'm going to kind of start assuming some of those things are, are clear. Um, what is important here is that this matrix A summarizes the relationship between our basis vectors. And what this gives us now is a way of defining distance where all we need is the coordinates. Okay, and our distance measure, our inner product, is defined in terms of this matrix A. It is defined in terms of how our basis vectors relate to each other. So remember last week when I was saying that you can measure a line in terms of meters or kilometers, and then that was a change of basis. It's exactly that. But now, when you're doing this in a product, it's coming out very explicitly in how we define distance. Okay. So that is the most important thing. This is known in different versions of math as our metric tensor. Tensor being a high dimensional version of a matrix, but a matrix is a kind of tensor. So this is our metric, matrix, metrix, tensor, so on. It tells us how we measure distance in a given vector space. And all we care about then is what the coordinates are doing. All right. Is everyone clear with this? Because this is like the conceptual part of this distance calculation that I really care about. Okay. All right. Everyone online still happy? Yeah, present. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, come on, slides update. Okay, there we go. All right, so what, what can we say now directly? What can we now directly say about A? Well, firstly, A is symmetric, right? Because the inner product of BI and BJ is the same as BJ and BI. Okay, so re regardless of which order we do this inner product between our basis vectors, it's going to give us the same answer. And then we also have that if we feed in the same X into uh, both arguments of this inner product, so instead of having uh, Y and X over here, we just feed in two, uh, the same X's over there, we know that it's going to be greater than zero. Okay? And we know this because the inner product is positive definite. And so in general, the main point here is that any inner product can, or any a symmetric matrix that satisfies equation 19 and a symmetric matrix that satisfies equation 19, symmetric, positive, definite. If we do not have the strict inequality and only on equation, is this English? <laughs> anyway, I, I want to get to a point here. So oh yeah, this one. So for a real value, finite dimensional vector space in an ordered basis B of V, it holds that for an inner, uh, for this inner product space, it's an inner product if and only if there exists a symmetric positive definite matrix A, which satisfies this. Okay. So how do we kind of change this into words? A, an inner product is an inner product if and only if we can write it in terms of some kind of matrix multiplication that acts on the coordinates of a vector space. Okay. And this matrix that's in the middle is always going to be relative to your basis. It's always going to be relative to how we represent distance in this space. Okay. And your basis. Uh, and your basis in general, as long as it's a minimal spanning set, okay, it doesn't have to always be orthogonal. They might be kind of overlapping in a way. It doesn't matter. It'll come out in the elements of this matrix A here. Okay? So, and it's going to always be symmetric as a result. So, in that case, it might be something like one, two, three, and three. Okay? Meaning that for that one, when I took the inner product of my first basis vector, it equal to one. So, right, so it has like a, a length of one. If I did B1 and B2, it had a length of three. This is maybe a bad example. Let's go 0.3. So it had a length of 0.3. All right. So in that case, they're very close to being orthogonal, but they are kind of pointing in a similar direction. So that I know that if I've moved one unit in the direction of B2, I've moved about 0.3 units in terms of B1 or vice versa. That's what this is saying over here. And then lastly, this two here is if I do B2, B2, it's like kind of how, how long is the, the basis vector there. All right. Uh, an important thing to then recognize is, again, if I'm doing, let's say, B1, B1, and I am, this is, again, kilometers, and I'm going to go instead to a unit of measurement. Let's say this is meters, and I'm going to go to the unit of measurement, which is kilometers. I'm then changing my basis to be 1,000 
P1 comma 1000 P1. And again, you can pull both of these out and you can see now how much this metric tensor is going to change. But at the end of the day, it is still going to reflect the fact that now you've added the scalar in the front of both. Okay. And that'll still show up in your matrix A. All right. So that's the general notion of an inner product. And again, what we care about is it can be represented in terms of the matrix multiplication, where the matrix has an important meaning coming from your basis. Cool. And then A is going to be symmetric, positive definite. Okay, then uh, I can try to decipher this. Um, oh, okay, all this is saying is that in equation 19 here, if this inequality is not strictly greater than, so if it is greater than or equal to zero, then the terminology here is not positive definite, it is positive semi definite. So it can also be zero. Um, yeah, it's just another kind of extension of the terminology, but it's just a, a wording thing. And it is kind of, it's helpful to know. There are cases where a positive semi-definite matrix makes a, a meaningful difference in how we process things because you can then get a zero over here. All right. Um, so two further properties of a symmetric positive definite matrix, the null space or kernel of A consists only of zero. This can be seen by noting that x transposed a x is greater than zero for all x not equal to zero. And so as a consequence, we know that a times x is also not equal to zero if x is not equal to zero, right? If that was true, then you would just get a zero vector here. And then it would be x transposed times by zero, which would also still give you zero. So what this means is that you know a does not have a lot broad null space. Right, it's only the, the kind of trivial solution. And then the diagonal, diagonal elements of A, which is denoted by A, I, I, are all positive. So the way you can see that is if we substitute in, I don't love the fact that it's using this E notation here because E is usually used to denote a basis. So again, what we're talking about here are coordinate vectors, not, not basis vectors. The basis vectors are already inside of A. All right, so this is where your basis vectors are. And then if we substitute in the coordinates vectors that are zeros except for one on the ith element, all right, also known as your kind of standard or canonical form, then you'll see that the, this is where you kind of extract the diagonal elements, right? So in this case, it'll be, let's say one zero, and then this is a one one, a one two, a two one, a two two, one zero, and you do this matrix multiplication out, what you're going to end up getting is just A11 as the answer. All right, you can verify that if you want. But what this will tell us is because we know that this whole calculation has to be greater than zero, what we've now restricted to is A11, the diagonal, also being greater than zero by definition. What this is essentially saying is that you can't have a basis vector that has no length. That makes intuitive sense, right? It's If a basis vector is the zero vector, it's useless. And also you'll then always have something like a null space, which you can always represent whatever you like as a linear combination of the zero basis vector. So basis vectors don't make sense if they're zero, and that's essentially what this is saying. I wouldn't overcomplicate that one more than it needs to be. Okay. Are we all doing all right so far? Everyone kind of happy with how this is going? Is it making sense? <laughs> Which, which part of this is, are we getting shaky on at least? Should I ask online? <laughs> Presence. <laughs> Presence. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. So earlier when we were talking about the like, in general, when would they ever be negative? Yeah, norms can't be, can't be negative. And it's coming from this fact that you're, I mean, we're, we're going to get there. I understand this is taking the long route to it, but you use these inner products to define a norm and the inner products are positive definite. So they can't be. Okay. So let's try and just keep track of where we're at, right? So you represent vector spaces with bases. It's a linear combination of bases. So that tells us basis with coordinates 
All we're doing now is trying to measure distances or kind of relate two different vectors in the space that we've now defined. And the way you do that is with an inner product. Okay. And then when you do this in a product with a dark product like this and incorporate the bases, you get a matrix in the middle, which tells you how we're measuring the space. It just relates your, your basis vectors. And then that's it. It's a very general notion up to now. Okay. So then lengths and distances. So we've already discussed norms, but there's a special class of norms that are induced by inner product. And specifically, it's when we take an inner product and square root the thing. Like that. Okay. So you also can't get a negative out of the square root. So all inner products induce a norm. Not all norms are induced by an inner product. Uh, we're not going to, I know the slides say that we're going to do something more general, and I'll touch on it in, at the end for interest's sake. But in general, again, this is more of a, I care far more about the linear algebra and the geometry of this. And anything more general will usually not be very, very geometric and more conceptually difficult. So I'm not going to go there. But yeah, not all norms are induced by an inner product. But if you have defined an inner product, then you can use it to induce a norm. And again, in that case, what you've done is you always feed in the same x twice. All right. So the inner product is the more general thing where it can be x and y here. But if you want to use it as a norm to measure the distance of a single vector, then obviously you can only pass in that vector. Okay, so it's going in twice. That's then we know for a fact that because of the positive definiteness, that inner product under the square root will be greater than zero. And then so as a result, the square root is well defined, right? Because you can't take the square root of a negative value. Okay, so parallelogram inequality, that's this uh, inequality at the bottom here. So if this holds, then we can induce a norm. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I actually haven't seen the proof of this. Um, I kind of always just take it for granted. It's not something I've ever seen come up in anything I've ever done or, or seen in maths, but it's good to know. So parallel, good to know it exists. The parallelogram inequality, if it holds, then we can use the inner product to induce the norm. All right. And if anyone's particularly interested and looks this up and you want to tell me what it does, that would be cool. If not, I might just look it up as well. Um, what is more kind of important with these induced norms is the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So for an inner product on a vector space, so again, just taking in two vectors from B and giving us a scalar, the induced norm must satisfy the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. And that is to say that if we apply the inner product on X and Y and take the absolute value of this, then it is always going to be less than taking the norm of x and multiplying it with the norm of y. Okay, so that is then the same as saying that the square root of this x x times by square root of the inner product of y y. And then that's going to be less than doing inner product x y absolute values. Okay, so that's the that's that inequality. It's known as the cauchy schwarz inequality. Uh, it comes up in information theory a little bit, but uh, aside from that, and aside from kind of that level of complexity, uh, I haven't seen it come up in any maths aside from that either. It has a general, my, from what I remember, it also has a very general, um, similar to the triangle inequality, it has a very general flavor to that, where it's easier to calculate the norm of x, y directly rather than norm of x, norm of y, that sort of thing. Okay, and so this then helps us define what is known as a metric. So this is again the next kind of step in our terminology. So if X is a set, then the mapping which takes in two elements of the set and maps onto a real number uh, is a metric and is called a distance if it satisfies the following properties. So D is positive definite, uh, or at least according to this notation over there. 
but now in this case it takes in x and y okay so this would again probably be closer to positive semi-definite because of the equality to zero uh, but if d takes in x and y and x and y elements of v and if this distance is equal to zero it implies that x is equal to y that is the first constraint d is symmetric so whether or not we take in x and y or y and x you're going to get the same answer and then the triangle inequality holds which we discussed earlier then we have what is known as a metric or a distance okay so it is now a again when you're kind of trying to keep your wits about you and trying to keep your, your mapping of these definitions the main important thing here is that it takes in two elements of a set but now they can be different okay whereas when we're talking about things like norms it was only ever one element of a set that was going into the inner product twice okay so the norm tells you the length of one vector this metric tells you now the relationship between two vectors but again also it's going to use an inner product so we do not need to be this general in this course and we restrict, restrict ourselves to x being vector spaces as opposed to arbitrary sets uh, and so we know kind of that's a more restricted definition but for example we can use a norm as a metric on a vector space and the way we do that is to first take x minus y and then just apply the norm okay that then gives us a distance okay so we use an inner product to induce a norm we then use the norm to now just define a distance or a metric okay which is also why this a that a matrix is called our metric tensor it's because when we do something like this you're going to end up getting x minus y times by a x minus y that needs to be transpose okay we use it to define a distance to define a metric it is our metric tensor okay but that is the i guess the the step of these things is is kind of in a product which satisfies the bilinearity symmetry positive definiteness then you can do a norm which is when one vector you apply that in a product to itself and then do the square root and then if first you go x minus y and then take the norm that then gives you a distance between x and y and i you know fair warning a lot of people get this wrong in the first place is they don't do that I ask for the distance between x and y, and I get the norm of x uh, minus the norm of y, or something like that. So, as much as it seems, you know, like this is all just a bunch of definitions being thrown at you, this is one that can go wrong quickly. Okay, so maybe put a star next to it. So don't forget this one. If you need the distance between them, it is first x minus y, then you do the norm. Okay, and in general, I'll tell you which inner product to use in the test. So if we use an inner product space, we can go a step further and use the induced norm, which is the one kind of obviously that comes from the inner product on that space. Okay. Are we all kind of happy for now? Again, very definition heavy, but we just need to remember how a basis gives us an inner product. Inner product gives us a norm. Norm gives us a distance. That's it. That's all we've done for today. All right, then from this, it can give us angles. So this is a good place to uh, kind of stop and take some questions. If anyone online has any questions, please drop it in now. Um, also to say it's 20 to four, but I only have 10 slides left. So I'm happy to push through and we can finish like much earlier today as well. Okay, we're happy with that. Okay, no questions coming online. Cool. All right, so the inner product captures the geometry of a vector space by defining the angle between two vectors as well. So observe that we can obtain the following directly from Cauchy Schwartz inequality. So I've written it at the top here just to remind you. So from the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, we have the fact that this is true. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're just going to divide both sides by the norm of x and the norm of y. So then you're going to get the absolute value of the inner product of x. And y up top there i know my handwriting is a little bit not neat but it's my best and now we have divided by x divided by y in the denominator is less than or equal to one and then when we drop the absolute values in the numerator there then what we're left with is the fact that it's between negative one and one all right so that's how you at least derive this from the culture schwartz inequality 
And then from there, we know that this, because we know that this value is between negative one and one, and we also know that there is a unique mapping from little omega uh, elements of zero to pi such that this is true, then we can use this to define angle. Okay, and it's because this is bounded by negative one and one. So the number omega is the angle in radians between the vector x and y. So what is this kind of at least intuitively saying? It's saying that what is the distance or the difference between x and y if I don't care about their length? Okay, so this is what this normalizing by x and normalizing by y is doing. Okay, and also, I, mean, I think I showed this in a one note at some other point, but because we know that this norm of x is actually a constant, let's call it, uh, let's say 1 over the norm of x is c, and then 1 over the norm of y is, I don't know, d. Then what we've really got here is just two constants that can now be taken into this inequality. Okay, and I'm going to do that. And again, it's using the, just the bilinearity of this dot product. So we have x divided by the norm of x and y divided by the norm of y. This is now saying that regardless of whatever length x and y started with, I'm going to divide them by that length. So it's always going to then be a unit vector. Okay, so the way we take a vector of arbitrary length and get it to a vector of length uh, with norm one is dividing by the norm. It's doing exactly that. So what this is going to do is it's going to try and take x and divide it by its norm so that it's pointing in the same direction it was originally, but has unit length in terms of the inner product. Same for y. It's going to take y, divide it by its norm so that it's kind of points in the same direction, but um, has unit length in terms of this inner product. And so now both of them, their length doesn't matter. So the only thing that determines how vector X and vector Y relate, if the length doesn't matter, is their angle. Okay? And so that's what's left. And after that, it's then just because, again, cos is between negative 1 and 1 in this case. You can then just, and you know that the because cos is continuous and x and y is just a cos on the side, and you'll get some mapping to omega, and that will tell us our angle. But that's the whole kind of at least conceptual where this comes from is the fact that because of bilinearity, you can actually pull in these norms into the inner product. And what you have is a normalized vector for both of your arguments. Okay, and then the only thing left again is to differentiate them is their angle. And so if you have cos pi over 2, that is equal to 0. And so now that then means the inner product between x and y is 0. Okay? So when vectors are orthogonal, they're pointing in opposite or kind of 90 degrees to each other, then their inner product is always going to be 0 by default. Okay. Everyone happy with this so far? So usually this equation is kind of taken a little bit for granted. But I think understanding that what's kind of come out of this is this normalization is the main geometric idea. Is everyone getting that bit at least? Oh, thanks. Cool, thanks, Leroy, but thank you for that. Um, cool, all right. So that's how this then gets the angle and that defines the orthogonality. So if two vectors, x and y, are orthogonal, it's if and only if they, the inner product is equal to zero. And it's denoted by this kind of symbol, which should be familiar. If, in addition, x is orthogonal to y, we, and we have unit length vectors, we say that x and y are orthonormal. But again, that's if x and y were originally unit length, all right? Not obviously once you plug them into the equation and, and normalize. Okay, so orthonormal is an important concept when we get to matrix decomposition, because a lot of the times what we want is to find basis vectors which are orthonormal. Okay, what that means is that we can simplify the calculation of a lot of things very easily. Okay, you can then generalize to ideas around the power of a matrix multiplication. You, once you get something, it's an orthonormal representation. Okay, so that's where we're heading with this, is how to get measure ortho, orthogonality of basis vectors mainly. Okay, uh, a direct implication of this is that the zero vector is orthogonal to every other vector in the space. You know, again, it's gonna give you zero, but that's also fairly trivial, that doesn't help us. 
But uh, yeah, by technical definition, zero is orthogonal vector to everything. And so orthogonality over does, I'm sorry, let me get the question. Uh, does normalizing orthogonal vectors make them orthonormal? Is this the, or it's the size of the norm? Uh, yes, if you normalize orthogonal vectors independently, it will make them orthonormal. Cool. Yeah, by, by normalizing, you're not going to rotate the vector. So vectors that were orthogonal will stay orthogonal. So that's a good, you know, your, your intuition to check that is good at least. You can't always take these things for granted. Um, but yeah, this, these will stay orthogonal. Um, so it is worth noting the orthogonality of two vectors depends on the inner product used. So for example, if you consider X is one and one transposed again, so you get a column vector and Y is equal to minus one and one in R squared. If you use the normal dot product as the inner product, in this case, you get zero in which case the angle is you know, 90 degrees, pi over two radians. And so X and Y are orthogonal. But if you use a different inner product, such as in the bottom here, where, as I said earlier, this two zero one representation will come from your basis, how you represent these things. Um, then in that case, these two coordinate vectors now are not orthonormal. They have you know, radians that are not pi over two. Okay, so it comes down to how we represent space. Okay, and that's the, the general notion. But again, I think it becomes very hard to start imagining these things when your basis vectors are not orthonormal or kind of even unit length and things like that. So in this case, what you need to almost rely on the algebra and use, again, like we're chatting, I was chatting someone at the break, usually maths is about having an intuition for a simple case that you use to like understand everything else, like analogies. This is an example where you might want to make an analogy towards uh, Euclidean space and use that to understand the general idea of what something like this would be representing. Okay. Yes. Sorry, you don't mind. So the person um, in the chat asked when like, you could make it that you could make them normal. Yes. But earlier you were like they had to already have been Oh, so, okay. So I just think, I, I think I get what you're saying. So um, if you're going to call something orthonormal, it means that their, their vectors were, so if I say X is orthonormal to Y, then it means that the inner product of X and Y is equal to zero. And that the norm of X is equal to one, which is also the norm of Y. Okay. If I'm going to say it's orthonormal, it implies that those two things are true. But uh, if, what I do instead is I have X and Y such that this isn't true by default. And then I update them. Let's say I say X is equal to X over the norm of X. You know, now I've normalized the vector. Then I can plug now it's orthonormal. You know what I mean? But so you can do these two steps separately. What I was saying earlier is that, um, you know, it kind of bakes that idea into this calculation. But that's just how you get the, the angle between them as a value. It's not, um, this itself isn't going to tell you if they're unit length, obviously. Okay, cool. So that's orthogonality. And one of the cool things about orthogonality is that if we have a square matrix A, uh, and if it's an orthogonal matrix, so one thing I hate about this, and I, I don't always hold, you know, hold to this, is that they call an orthogonal matrix, a matrix where its columns are orthogonal to each other and, nor, uh, and normalized, okay? So it's an orthogonal matrix, but it implies that its columns are also normal. I don't love that. I usually just call it an orthonormal matrix, because I think why, why be ambiguous? But uh, anyway, in general mathematics, if you hear the term an orthogonal matrix, it usually implies that it's normal as well. Anyway, if A is a square matrix and it's an orthonormal, it's an orthonormal matrix if and only if its columns are orthonormal to each other. And so that means that when you take A times by A transpose, you're going to get the identity matrix. Or if you're going to get A transpose A, you're going to get the identity matrix. And the reason for this is that 
AI with the, the inner product between the column AI and column AJ is we've told you that it's orthogonal to each other. So that's going to be zero. Okay. And then I've told you that they have unit length. So when it's AI, AI, it's going to be one. Okay. So the cases where it's I and I is along the diagonal of this matrix. And the cases where it's I and J are on the off diagonal of this resultant matrix. Okay. So it gives you the identity by definition of having orthonormal columns. What that then means is that A transpose is its own inverse. Or A, yeah, the inverse of A is A transposed over here. And again, the, the notion of an inverse by definition was whatever vector that when multiplied by A gave us the identity. The transpose in this case clearly fits that definition. And this is huge because inverting a matrix sucks. It is the most computationally expensive thing on earth next to, I don't know, some, it's more expensive than matrix multiplication. You have to take determinants and things like that that we haven't uh, calculated yet, uh, gone through yet, but it is really a, a terrible calculation. But transposing is actually pretty easy and parallelizable to, to like absolute health. So when this is true, you can leverage this, it is huge. It'll like speed up your code by you know a billion times. If if nothing else from this course, this will make your life easier. And so I think this is one of the coolest tricks to remember. An orthonormal matrix is its own inverse, or its transpose is its own inverse. Cool. And that is also really important when we come to eigen decomposition. So laying the groundwork for that too. Okay, so transformations by orthogonal matrices are special because the length of a vector is preserved when A is applied. For example, in the case of the dot product, so here we have the norm squared. What this corresponds to is AX transposed times by AX. Okay, we know that from our identity, AX transpose is equal to X transposed, A transposed. So that's how you get the second line over here. Okay, I'll leave that there. And then now that we know that A is an orthogonal matrix, its columns are orthonormal, we know that when that product happens, the middle, we're going to get an identity matrix. Okay. And so when we do the identity matrix times by X, we're just going to get X. And then after that, we get X transposed times by X, which is just the norm of X squared again. Okay. So the squared is just because we don't have a square root on that or there. So what this means is that by applying A to X as we did here, it will give us the exact same norm as having the normal vector. So number one, multiplying by orthonormal matrices uh, does not change the length of any of our vectors. Okay, secondly, we can look at what it does with angles. So the angle between two vectors is also preserved and this is an example of invariance. If uh, this is, uh, if anyone was curious about that. So it's another case where our result is invariant to any manipulations we have. So the manipulation here is multiplying X and Y by A, the result stays the same, okay, invariance. So for example, in the case of the dot product, we have the following. So we know our definition of uh, angle. So we have A of X again in a product. You just do all the same steps on the previous slide from above. You get back to your identity matrix times by Y and then you get that at the top. So it's exactly the same steps I just did on the previous, on the previous slide. Okay. And that means that the angle between all of these, uh, all of these vectors is preserved even under a uh, multiplication by an orthogonal matrix. It might be kind of changing our reference frame a bit, but again, the relationship between two matrices, uh, two vectors is preserved. Um, and so we have previously used bases to perform a number of algebraic tasks. Uh, re further refinement of the concept is useful, namely orthonormal bases. So if we consider an n-dimensional vector space and a vector B and vectors B1 through Bn, which form basis of B, then if all basis vectors are orthogonal to each other, so the inner product is zero and they are normal, 
such that if you have a length one in a product, it means I and J are the same, then what it is called an orthonormal basis, okay? If only 32 is satisfied, then it's called an orthogonal basis. But again, what we really often enjoy having is orthonormal basis. That means whatever di direction I move in, the distance is being translated in a relatively the same way. Whereas if I'm measuring you know, distance to this direction in kilometers, this one in meters, it makes it somewhat difficult to then say how far I'm moving at a 45 degree angle. Not impossible, just not easy. Cool. And so that's why we want ortho, uh, orthonormal bases. Um, and so we can extend the idea of orthogonality to entire vector spaces. Okay, so if we consider a d dimensional vector space V and an m dimensional subspace U, okay, so we've gone through this notation, a vector subspace of VU, then it use orthogonal complements denoted as that is a d minus m dimensional subspace of V. And this orthogonal complement contains all vectors of V that are orthogonal to every vector in U. Okay? So we would have some plane over here, and then it's orthogonal. I can't really draw this in super high res, but then it's orthogonal complement, if it's sitting in 3D, would be the vector poking out of the screen that is perpendicular to that plane. Okay? It's all vectors that are orthogonal to the plane that we're looking at. And this should also look fairly familiar because this is actually the rank finality theorem. Okay? It's come up again. Essentially, what we're saying is we have some d dimensional vector space u. And so its dimension on the right at the bottom here is d. And then we have the orthogonal complement, which is a d minus m dimensional space. And so when we were looking at um, you know, matrix mappings or you know, anything like that, and we were talking about what dimension got left behind. It was all matrices that were orthogonal to that basis that we were multiplying by. Okay, all matrices that map onto zero. But I, I think I missed a message. I don't fully understand when they say orthogonal complement. Oh, okay, you see now. All right. Did the picture help you, Leroy? Great. Oh, okay, cool. Good to know. All right. So this is also coming out in the kernel melody theorem, right? It's, we know that the kernel, the image of a mapping, okay, and its null space, when taken together, must match their dimension. It is literally what subspace of V is acted upon by a mapping, and then what subspace isn't. If it isn't, then it's orthogonal to the part that is being uh, being operated on. Sorry, I'm reading V, not U. So it's the part that some operator can operate on, which is U, and then whatever is orthogonal to that, which it can't, which will then be D minus M. Okay? So we can see that those ideas coming up consistently. So that's the orthogonal complement of a vector space. Okay, and we can also represent X which is an element of V as a weighted sum of basis vectors from U and its orthogonal complement. And first we note that the intersection of U and its complement, this is not the same. Okay. So first we note that the intersection of the two vector spaces, so U and its orthogonal complement, it's just going to be zero, all right? They both have to be vector spaces, so they both still have to contain the zero vector, but that is going to be the only point in which they overlap. So going back then to the picture, we have this, okay? So the square is U, and the line coming out of it is 90 degrees to it, but they both intersect at that point there, which is zero, the zero vector, okay? Other than that, they are completely separate, and you're going to have one set of basis vectors representing the plane, okay? And then one basis vector representing the point coming out of the screen in the Z axis. This one. I'm gonna stop there for two seconds because I have a hunch this thing's gonna tell me it's disconnected. Oh no, we've caught up, okay. So we have the 
Okay, so at the top left, we have the basis of the square, which are those two arrows there. And then obviously the one arrow coming out of the square, it's gonna need its own basis vector. And so we can represent that with equation 34. And so any vector in the larger V space can be represented as a sum of basis vectors, which correspond to a point on the square plus the movement out of it. And it's kind of what I was saying earlier about affine spaces as well, right? Where if you have a consistent movement in one direction, you can then drop that dimension. It was essentially saying that I have a square, I have a plane, and then that you know third dimension had a consistent shift. I could then just treat that as a constant, okay? And turn it into a 2D problem with a shift rather than a 3D problem. That's only again possible when this third vector coming out of the plane is a, you know, it's, it's always gonna be one value. But anyway, you can always then represent it as the subspace and its orthogonal complement, and you'll get a basis of the entire embedded space. Another way to look at it, you can always represent it as the kernel and the image of a space. Okay. And then lastly, the last two slides for today, and this is a general notion that, again, it's also I'm going to rely heavily on. But up until now, we've only really considered the inner product of finite dimensional vectors, which again, what I care about. The concepts are far more powerful than this. Specifically, we can generalize to entities. So with countably infinite entries, so for example, x1, x2, all the way to an infinite number of x's. The way you do this is by determining what is called a kernel. So if you've ever heard of things like Hilbert spaces, reproducing, her, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and so on, that's how we deal with infinite entries. There's a way where you can represent an infinite summation in closed form, and it gives you a matrix that is not infinite sized, obviously, because we can't do that. And then that gives you like an infinite representation of uh, a kind of tractable way of doing an infinite representation of space. Uh, and then we can also deal with uncountably infinite entries, such as the real space, for example, and the most common example of that is if you do integration over a function, okay? So this comes up a lot in functional analysis. So if you consider two functions, u and v, both taking in a scalar and producing a scalar, then these are uncountably infinite spaces, okay? And the difference between a countably infinite space and an uncountably infinite space is, for example, a countably infinite space is the integers. I can say one, two, three, four, five, Okay, they go on into an infinite number of them, but there are discrete steps between the each element of the set. Whereas an uncountably infinite set goes on for forever, but the steps between them are infinitely small. All right, so zero to one, infinite number of points in that space. Okay, and so one way to generalize to uh, an inner product over functions is if we know that they share a domain, so x, then we feed that into both u and v, and we integrate along that path. Okay, so this inner product, as with all inner product, does induce a norm and induce a norm over the functions u and u and v here, and we now have the concept of orthogonality of functions. What's going to happen here is essentially if like one function goes up, the other one goes down. When you integrate, they're going to give you zero. And so on, in some you know set set way. And so there's a bit more nuance with regard to precisely defining this integral, and you need to do things like what's called measures and integral construction, and the concept of, as I said, Hilbert spaces. And I mean, it says it in this, but we certainly don't. I don't go into this in this course. I think what we learn in this course makes it far easier to learn these things. Though. So I think once you understand the intuition of an inner product, generalizing it towards just having this definition helps. Again, you'll use the concept of linear algebra and orthogonality of a vector space to help you intuit what orthogonality of a function space means. 
even though they're not actually the same thing. In the same way that you can define polynomials, like in the first lecture, I said that a polynomial can be defined as a vector where, you know, one times x plus two times x2, you can represent that as a vector one and two. All right, you can then do inner products of that. It's a similar idea. All right, but again, I'm not, that's for your interest. So u and v in this case are scalar functions and not vector like. Yeah, in this case, they're scalars. Um, I mean, there are high dimensional functional, uh, yeah, functionals and uh, that wrong thing. And inner products for high dimensions, but yet yeah, in this case they are taking in scalars and producing scalars. All right, that is the the last slide for today. I don't know if anyone has any any questions. We do have a lot of time, so if anything's got lost in the in the process up to now, now is a good time to go through it, especially heading towards your test. Okay, we're happy. All right, thanks everybody. I'll see you next week.